I hope you're ready for 2020. I mean, starting Tuesday night with communion, candlelight, Christmas service, the next week, New Year's Eve, prayer, one-hour services, pray into the new year, Christmas Eve, one-hour service, and then in March, Vision Month, who and the two new guys with this issue, you, you know Chris and you know Levi, but Darius and Tim are going to freak you out. They're great. You're going to love them. And uh, vision this year is going to be at a whole nother level. So get ready for 2020. Hey, if you plan for the same, you get the same. If you plan to increase, see something new, God do something more, you will receive according to your faith, be it unto you. So let's make 2020 a great year. Amen. 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 I am ready. Well, all this month we've been teaching on follow the star. And uh, most of you know, when I'm here, uh, this part of the service, I'm giving you a Bible study. We have a theme, we, we have a goal for this lesson, and I'm just giving you scriptures and trying to, uh, the theologian says, expose. It's expository teaching to bring the scriptures to light to help you see what the Bible says. I, I'm not a real sermonizer. You know, some guys take one scripture and they just give an amazing message, and I'm always like, wow, that was amazing. But I'm more of just a Bible teacher, so I'm giving you Scripture, and I'm praying when you leave today, you know more of your Bible. And if you hang around Christian Faith Center for a while, you will know your Bible, what God says and how we live it, because the Word of God is alive and powerful. Faith comes from the Word and hearing the Word of God. So when you have the Word in your life, you have a solid foundation. Without the Word, you're following the world, you're following your feelings, you're following who knows what, and life is not as good. When it comes to Christmas time, many people don't know the difference between the Word and Christmas traditions. They don't know what's true and what's just fantasy. And many of our children don't know. So is angels kind of like Santa Claus? Are reindeer kind of like babies from heaven? Most people don't know. They wouldn't know what the Bible says about the Christmas story anything, any more than they would know you know, where these traditions came from and where our Christmas songs and Christmas poems came from. So you and I want to make sure that we understand the Bible story of Christmas. And we enjoy Santa. We can have fun with that stuff. Rudolph the red-haired reindeer, and we love all of that, right? One of the parents had to explain to their child that Rudolph actually had a red nose, but Pastor Casey was just saying he had red hair because Pastor Casey was tripping up there. But may I remind you, there is no Rudolph. The real Rudolph does not exist. So anyway, that's all fun stuff. We love it. Trees, right? Reindeer, we love it and the decorations and the songs and all that stuff. It's all great. As long as you know the difference between fantasy and reality, and there is a reality of God giving the greatest gift, his son Jesus, something that no one else could give, and the only answer to all our problems, and that he was born through a virgin, a father in heaven and a mother on earth. He is all God, but he's also all human. And that angels announced his birth, and wise men came to celebrate when he was two years old. These things are Bible realities, not traditions, but a part of the truth. And as we know the Lord, we know what we believe, and we know what is true, and we also know what's not true. 
And that makes your life strong. It gives you a foundation. It gives you a sure footing, a sure standing. You builders know your strong day, your foundation is strong, your house is going to go well. Your foundation is weak, you're going to have some problems. And the larger the structure, the bigger the foundation, deeper the foundation has to be. So let's be founded on the Word so we can live this life that God has called us to. Now I want to read a part of the Christmas story when the angels were announcing the birth of Jesus to the shepherds who were in the fields close by the barn where Jesus was born outside of Bethlehem. In Luke chapter 2 and verse 13, there suddenly was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest, on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Well then, the angels vanished and these shepherds said, we got to go find this. The angels told us there's a baby born in a manger wrapped in swaddling clothes. We got to go see it. And sure enough, they went and found the place where Jesus was. And they celebrated his birth. And they began to spread the word about his birth. Notice what the angels said. First of all, glory to God. Wendy mentioned we gather in church so we can worship God, connect with God. And that's something you don't have without church life. You don't have worship. You don't have that congregation. You don't have that agreement for worship and for prayer. And that's powerful. Glory to God and the multitude of angels all saying the same thing. And then they said, peace on earth. God knew the world needs peace. He's called the God of peace. Do you know the Bible said God is not the author of confusion? Anytime there's confusion, strife, animosity, tension, you know, people fighting, Jesus said in the last days, wars and rumors of wars. Wow, that's our world. People fighting over the funniest things, strangest things, and yet just drama. And if we don't have enough drama in our life, we turn on the TV so we can watch somebody else's drama. And we call them a drama. It's a drama show. Why do we love drama? Well, our flesh, the sin nature of all people, relates to the negative. That's why we do things that aren't good for ourselves. We do things we know aren't healthy. We do things we know aren't good for our marriage. We know we shouldn't do it, but we do it because we lean toward the negative until we are born again and we consciously lean toward God. So the flesh will always enjoy the strife, the division, the drama and the trauma, and you say, oh, I don't like that, I hate that, and yet you keep creating it, and you keep going out with the guy that's crazy, right? Because we like it. All people are attracted to negative in some way. We'll see if a lot of family gatherings haven't been together for months, so happy to see each other. Next thing you know, we're fighting over mashed potatoes, arguing something mom said. Mom, you always go, I can't stand that, mom. Why do you always say that? Haven't seen her for a year, but we just get into it. And the next thing you know, we got drama. It's just flesh. It's just people attracted to that strife and that anxiety. And until you consciously, sincerely, and not just on Sunday, but every day, seek after God, you'll never really know peace. And I want to talk about peace in three areas. Peace with God, peace with yourself, and peace with everybody else. It's not easy, but it's possible. In fact, God promises it. And it's a big part of Christmas. Peace on earth, goodwill toward men. 
Most people don't know that God has only goodwill toward them. They feel God's upset with them. God's not happy with them. God's angry with them. What do you think God's going to say about that? He's going to say, I love you, my son, my daughter. God knows who we are. He created us. He's not surprised. He's been watching us from Adam through generations of human struggle. So there's nothing new that God hasn't seen. By the way, you don't have a problem that the Lord hasn't looked at before. So when we feel like I'm the only one, God's like, come on. This is common. In fact, the Bible said every challenge, every tribulation, every test that we go through is common to man. So God says, I know all that stuff. I, I know you. I understand you. And I have nothing but goodwill towards you. And we say, but God, I, I'm not worthy. God said, no, no, no. It's not based on what you did. It's based on what Jesus did. Yeah, it's true. You're not worthy. But Jesus took your place. That's what Christmas is about. Messiah, Savior, Christ came and said, I'm going to stand between God and every human being. So when God looks at you, he first sees Jesus. And Jesus says, I, I got them covered, Lord. I, I've, I've taken their sin, and, and I've took their judgment, and, and I got grace on them, so, so they're okay. And God says, okay, I'm in. I love you. I'm for you. I have nothing but goodwill towards you. When Jesus hung on the cross, he took all the sin of humanity, he took all the judgment of God, and the scripture says he took all the wrath of God. That's why the sky went dark, and, and Jesus cried out, why have you forsaken me? And then his spirit and soul went into hell, not because of what he did, because of what we did. So the wrath of God was poured out on Jesus, so there's no more wrath of God for you. So God's not mad. Oh, but I messed up. Of course. We all mess up. We all make mistakes. Sometimes our mistakes are simply doubt, fear, worry, unbelief, laziness. Sometimes our mistakes are worse, and there's bigger consequences and bigger problems. But God always says, we're good. We're good. Nothing but goodwill. If you say to God, I know you've been mad at me, the Lord would say, huh, what? Nope, you think wrong. Peace on earth, goodwill toward men. In fact, the scripture said, if God loved you when you were lost and, and didn't care about him and had no time for him, how much more does he love you now that you're his son? You know, it's a funny thing about church. We'll tell lost people God loves them. We'll tell church people God's going to get you. That's a little weird, isn't it? That's religion. That's tradition. That's Santa Claus. You've been naughty. You're on my naughty list. God doesn't have a naughty list. He has good will toward man. Doesn't mean he approves of everything we do. Doesn't mean he thinks we should do bad things. It just means he's forgiven you. And through Christ, you are accepted in the beloved. So his, he's good. I think Caleb mentioned it two weeks ago in his message on hope. God said, I know my thoughts towards you, thoughts of peace, and to give you a hope and a future. It's from the book of Jeremiah. I know what I'm thinking. Don't tell me what I'm thinking. I know you're mad at me, Lord. Wait, don't tell me what I'm thinking. I have thoughts of peace towards you give you hope, give you a future. I'm not mad. I already dealt with all that through my son Jesus, and Jesus has you covered. That's why we call him Savior, Messiah, Lord, healer, provider, and that's why we're grateful, because we need a Savior. We really need a cover. Come on, somebody. That's why we're grateful. Amen? Have you ever had a friend that you thought was mad at you? 
And so you tiptoed around, you were nervous, you didn't know what to say, you didn't know if you should invite them over, you didn't know what you should do because they were mad at you. And, and so it went on for days, and then finally something happened and you bumped into each other, and you said, well, I know you've been upset, and they're like, huh? And you found out it was all in your mind. You, you misread a signal. You assumed something. Somebody else told you something that wasn't true. What a tragedy to lose a relationship because we assume somebody doesn't like us or, you know, whatever the issue was. And how many people do that toward God? They think God is judge and God is harsh and God is disappointed in them and God is condemning them and God says, no, goodwill. Christmas is goodwill. Peace on earth, goodwill towards man. Uh, God says, it's all good. It's all good. And you parents, your kids made mistakes. Little ones threw up, messed up, stuff all over, drew on the walls. You didn't kick them out. You didn't throw them out of the house. Tonight, you're sleeping in the doghouse. Now, we get upset with our kids when they do things like that, but they're our kids, and we love them, and we support them, and we cover them, and we protect them, because like our Father in heaven, that's what parents do. Your Father has got you, and His will towards you is always good. Will God heal me? Yes. Well, how do you know? Because He's good. Will God help me? Yes. Well, how do you be sure? Because he's good. Will God provide for me? Yeah. Well, how can I know for sure? Because he's good. Surely, goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. Yeah. The promises of God are yes and amen. I'm quoting you Bible. I'm not giving you Santa Claus. I'm not giving you red-nosed reindeer. I'm giving you Scripture. Goodwill. Come on this Christmas. Embrace it. Believe it. Accept it. Lose the guilt. Lose the condemnation. Lose the worry that God's mad at you. God has nothing but good for you. In Romans 5, it says, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ and access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Whoo! Me and God are cool. I bump into God, I'm like, peace. He's like, peace. It's all good. Right? Don't have to be nervous. Don't have to be able to, uh-oh, got to go to God's office. You're going to God's office? I know. What does he want? I don't know, but I've got to go. We go to God as if something is bad, but it's all good. You have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Didn't earn it, aren't worthy of it, but Jesus gave it to you. That's Christmas. It's the gift of God. Goodwill towards man. So you have to believe that. You have to embrace that. You have to know that. Because the flesh will say, you're unworthy. You're so stupid. You're, you should feel bad. You should feel guilty. Uh, who do you think you are? Something's wrong. It's not going to be good. And, and, it, and it drags you toward the negative. But you stay on the word. And you know through the word of God, you have peace with God. In Galatians chapter 5, it says the Holy Spirit brings fruit in our life. When you walk in the Spirit, you have love, joy, and what's the third one? Come on, you Bible scholars, love, joy, and peace. So how do you know you have the Holy Spirit in your life? Well, the initial evidence is normally you pray with the Spirit, but then the love of God, the joy of God, the peace of God. Peace from God passes understanding. In other words, there's no natural reason why I should be relaxed right now. But I have peace. I'm at rest. I'm not anxious. I'm not stressed. I'm not under pressure. I don't feel urgency. 
And your anxiety is not getting on me. I'm immune to your drama. That's a strange place to live, but only by the Holy Spirit. Because with the Holy Spirit, we have love, joy, and peace. Peace starts with God, which means it's not dependent on our world. Has nothing to do with going, what's going on in our world. Doesn't matter what's going on in your family. Doesn't matter what's going on with the politicians. Well, how can we be at peace when the whole climate is falling apart? You know, I just trust that God has got this thing, and he gave me peace. Well, we need to pick it. We need to fight. We need to protest. Yeah, I'm not going to. Have peace with God. God's got me. He's got the whole world in his hand. He's got the whole wide world in his hand. He's got the whole world. So why are you freaking out? Tragically, normally, the greatest fears and anxieties and worries, protests and drama comes from people who don't believe in God. So I guess they have a good reason to freak out because they think the whole thing is in their hands. They don't know. It's in God's hands. So we have peace with God. Start there. I believe. I have peace with God. Secondly, have peace with yourself. Most of us don't have very much peace with ourselves. Let's put it in common vernacular. Most of us aren't very comfortable in our own skin. We get nervous around other people. We're afraid maybe of how we look. We worry about our hair or our skin or the shape of our body or are we smart enough or what will they think about us? Will they accept me? So the the bottom line is we're not comfortable with ourselves. So we think, uh, one more cosmetic surgery. Uh, if I just had a little bit more money, I could buy more stuff to camouflage who I am. We're always wishing we had something we don't have because the bottom line is we're not comfortable in our own skin. I know how that feels. Boy, it creates lots of anxiety because you're trying so hard or you just stay away. You, you stay lonely. You stay disconnected. If you do come to church, you come in late, you leave early because you want to stay anonymous. I understand that. I've been there. But when you get comfortable in your own skin, you can chill. You have peace, peace with yourself. And when you are at peace, you're trusting God. I don't really care what you think about me. I hope you like me. I hope we're good. If we're not, bummer, sucks for you. But I'm not going to go have another surgery to try to get you to like me. I'm not going to change and try to be something else so you'll like me. We live in a world, we have a culture of anxiety. And I think we've turned the anxieties of our self-esteem and, and, and how we feel about ourselves into an addiction. Now, normally we think of addiction as like drugs or alcohol or something, which I, I've been there, and I relate to that. And I know you'll do things that you know are bad, you know will hurt you, but you just do it because that's what you do, and you don't even know why you're doing it. That's why I'd never, act in, never ask an addict why he does what he does, because he doesn't know. It's just flesh. He's like, I know, I know, I know. First day at Washington Drug Center, I'm in drug rehab, and Julius is talking to me, and Julius is saying, all right, Big Red, I'm just reading through your problems here. You've been using this drug and that drug, and you got arrested this many times, and you got this in court, and you got that in court, and the judge said, and I'm like, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. I'm just sitting there for a half hour saying, I know, and Julius finally looked up to me, and he said, you know, if you knew anything, you probably wouldn't be sitting in a rehab center. You really don't know. I should have been saying, I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know why I'm doing it. I don't know anything. And that was the beginning of change. That's when I received the Lord. That's when I began to get his word. That's when I found some peace. You cannot drink peace. 
Some of you keep trying. You cannot smoke peace. Some of you keep trying. You cannot take a pill called peace. And we've all, many of us have tried. You cannot snort peace. It's going to get me a little peace here. <laughs> yep, there it is. Not peace because you're waking up in an hour crazy as a bed bug. You can't get peace from this world. And we don't know why we keep seeking for it and we get into drama all the time. Why do some people date unhealthy people? You know this guy is bonkers. You know he's mean. Okay, he's got a nice butt. But that's all. He has no brain. And you know it. And you're going to the club with him. You're sleeping with him. Next thing you know, you're going to be living with him. Because you have an addiction. Your addiction is drama. Your addiction is tension. Your addiction is strife. Your addiction is pain. And we all have that in various ways. We get addicted to it. And we watch it on TV. I don't have enough drama in my life, so I'm going to watch Judge Judy. I'm going to watch all these people who got drama, and they're in court, and they're fighting with their ex-wife and with their neighbor. Oh, man, can you believe that? They had to pay for the doghouse. Oh, man. Why are you watching that? We're watching Dr. Phil counsel somebody else. Really? You want to see someone else's drama? So bad. You will sit and eat Cheetos. <laughs> Seeing their drama. Okay, but we all do it. No condemnation. I'm there. <clears throat> but get my point. Maybe we're addicted to it. We love the drama. We got to stay connected to it. So we date the girl that's wacko. And she's so cute. Pastor, she's so cute. I know. I'm with you, bro. Was she crazy? <laughs> but why are we attracted to crazy? We're addicted to drama, trauma, anxiety, stress, pressure. And many of us have told ourselves the lie that we function best with, when we're under pressure. I do my best work when I'm under pressure. Nope, that's when you do your only work. The rest of the time, you just kind of check out, right? But then the deadline comes, and the pressure's there, and you got to do it. And you got to get it done. Remember when we were in school? i got to get this paper done, and you're up all night. Man, I'd have done a lot better paper if I'd have taken my time over the whole quarter. But no, i got to wait till the anxiety's there, stress is there, addicted to it. Stephen Covey referred to it as the urgency addiction. And we lie to ourselves, telling ourselves, we do our best work. I'm going to help this person. I'm going to fix them. I'm going to make them better. I'll be my best when I have to get it done. I'll wait till the last day, but I'll show up, and I'll pray that God helps me, and I'll do it. And we miss the peace of God because we're addicted to the chaos of our world. So let's find peace with him and peace with ourselves. Let's be comfortable in our own skin. Let's make a plan for our new year. Here's, here's the plan, financial plan, family plan, whatever career plan, whatever plan you need. Let's have a plan. I'm going to have the peace of God. 2020, I'm kicking my addiction. I'm getting on the wagon. I won't be sober. I didn't know you had a drinking problem. Nope, I got a drama problem. I'm through with Judge Judy and Dr. Phil. They're out. No more drama and trauma. I'm living in the peace of God. I'm not going to let pressure and anxiety affect how I talk to my kids. I'm not going to let stress and pressure affect how I talk to my spouse. I'm not going to let it affect my stomach and my head. I'm done with the pain of the spirit of the world's chaos. And I'm living 
in the peace of God. I got a gift for Christmas. Peace on earth. Goodwill toward man. Okay, the Holy Spirit will help you. In 2 Peter chapter 1, he said, grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus. As we know God, as we know his word, people say, how do you know God? You know him through his word, and then it becomes spiritual, and as you know him, you know what he says, and you know his spirit, your peace increases. Your peace grows. Peace in your life. People at work say, man, what happened to you? You've been so chill. You taking some new tranquilizers? No, don't need them anymore. Remember? Oh, I used to have to go out and have a drink to take the edge off. Why don't you have to do that anymore? There's no edge. I have peace with God and with myself. And peace is multiplied as we grow in the knowledge of God. That's why we're always asking you, be in church, learn the word. Read your Bible at home. Get into a life group. Learn the word of God. As you know God, as you grow in the knowledge of God, you will grow in peace. It will be multiplied in your life. Man, I've seen some tragic results. Domestic violence. People commit crime that affected their whole life. Children that are ostracized and homes that are broken up because of drama, strife, and lack of peace. Let's enter in to that peace of God by knowing him and walking with him. You know, I talk about renewing the mind a lot, and in Romans chapter 8 it says, when you renew your mind, you, you become spiritually minded. And in verse 6 it said, the carnal mind, the worldly mind is death. But the spiritual mind is life and, some of you know that scripture, it's life and peace. When you're spiritual minded, when you're thinking right, you're at peace. You're not the guy at the airport that's walking around sweating, upset, yelling at the flight attendant as if they control the airlines, right? You don't have something, you, I just gotta get it off my chest. No, you don't have it on your chest because you have peace with God. You're not the guy on the freeway honking his horn as if the horn will move everybody out of his lane. Shaking his fist, flipping people off. You're number one. It's like, bro, you need the peace of God. Here, let me give you a church invite. You need the peace of God. Whew. Rest, relax, chill. You know, the word peace actually means being whole and includes prosperity because when nations were at peace, they prospered. In Colossians 3 and verse 15, let the peace of God be the umpire of your life. I don't mean avoiding challenges or avoiding difficult things because sometimes, you know, you, you want to go work out, and you're thinking, oh, I don't want to do that. I don't have peace about that. Well, that's just being lazy. But I mean avoiding relationships and avoiding things that really do take away your peace, bring anxiety, bring stress, and, uh, and negative emotion into your life. Let the peace of God Rule your heart and mind. The Amplified Bible says, let the peace of God be the umpire of your life. And Philippians 4, verse 6, be anxious for nothing. Really, God? How am I going to live in this world and not be anxious about something? I remember saying to a, an elderly friend one time, hey, let's not worry about that. And he said, well, if I don't worry, who is? How about nobody? Nobody. Because it's not helping, and it's killing you. So be anxious for nothing. But I got to get the money for the payday, for the, for the payment, and if I don't have it, they're going to do this, and this is going to happen. Well, let's trust God. I don't know how God's going to work this out, but we're going to trust him. 
But, but they said, and the doctor said, and the banker said, and the lawyer said, and the boss said, yeah, but God said, let's not worry about it because it's not helping. We're going to be anxious for nothing. Amen. But in everything through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, we're going to let our requests be made known to God. Why? Because God's will is always good. So we're going to say, hey, God, I just pray you got this, and God's going to say, good, because I do. I got this. Just been waiting for you to ask me. You have not, because you ask not. Okay, I got you. I'm with you. And then it says, and the peace of God will guard your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. How much sickness comes from our anxiety? How much pain comes from our anxiety? How many divorces have been caused by our lack of peace? How many relationships have been broken by our lack of peace? How many people have never gotten to their full potential because they lived in fear and worry and stress and pressure? The greatest athletes talk about how everything slows down, they just relax, and everything becomes clear. That's when they're great. That's when they're their best. Let's have that every day. I'm going to live in the zone every day. Whew. But Pastor Treat, I'm freaking out. Yeah, well, your freaking out is not affecting me. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to love you, but I'm not going to join you. What's the first thing you got to do to help someone out of a hole? Stay out of the hole. Don't fall in. First thing you got to do is be strong yourself, and then you'll be able to help those around you. Hebrews says, be at peace with all people. When I read that scripture the other day, I said, you got to be kidding, God. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, pursue peace with all people. Really, God? Because there's a lot of weird people out there. But then I realized, oh, he's not saying they're going to change. He's saying, I'm going to change. I'm going to stay at peace. They may be doing anything, saying anything, you know, going through all their drama. I'm going to be like, oh, okay, wow. Mm -hmm. God bless you. Peace. Peace be to you. Here, have a little holy water. Right? Because if you jump into their drama, you become part of the problem instead of part of the answer. So you can have peace with God, peace with yourself, and pursue peace with all people. You can't change them, but you can stay at peace yourself. But Pastor Tree, my, my stepdaddy, my stepmama, my in-laws, I mean, they are crazy. Yeah, and probably won't change. But you can have peace. You can live at a different level. And by the way, when you jump in the battle, there is no difference between you and them. Come on, somebody. So let's keep the peace. Keep the peace. Okay, last scripture. Famous Christmas scripture. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Prince of Peace is he. Huh? My follow the star audition there, Matt, huh? Come on, next year. I'll put on some sequins. I'll go Elvis. In that scripture, it speaks of a son being given. He's the son of God. A child being born. He's the son of Mary. And the last name, his name shall be called the Prince of peace. 
He's not stressed. He's not worried. He knows, and he's at peace. He's your Lord. He lives with you. He's got you. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap right there. Close your eyes with me. We're going to pray together. I want to pray for you who truly need something new in your spiritual life. I'm going to pray with you who need the Lord, who need to be born of the Spirit, who need to be filled with the Spirit. You need something more in your walk with God. I know you're here in church, but have you really connected with Him? You believe in God, but are you born of the Spirit? Are you filled with the Spirit? If you need something more, you want something more in your spiritual life, would you lift up a hand right now? I'm not going to ask you to stand. I don't want you to come forward. I'm just going to pray, and I want you to be a part of this prayer. So just wave at me real quick. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I see you all over our sanctuary. Mill Creek, are you reaching out? Just lift it up. That's just your step of faith. That's just an act of faith. Yep, I'm in. I need this prayer. I want to be a part of this. I want something more in my walk with God. Anybody else? Good. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Man, so many folks. Thank you. Okay, put your hands down. Let's all pray together. Mill Creek family, even if you're watching online, Federal Way family, pray with me. Church, be my prayer team. You that lifted your hands, pray out loud. Let's say it together. Today, Father, I believe Jesus is Lord. I believe he came for me. He died for me and rose from the dead. Come into my life, Lord Jesus. Fill me with your spirit. Make me a new person. From this day on, I'm walking with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap today. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Caleb's going to close there in the Mill Creek service. God bless you guys. See you on Christmas Eve.